can we just start off? I know uh, from previous discussions with you, it started off for you with the Donald DeCar book. Can you just tell me a little bit about how, how, you, how the seed of, of watchmaking uh, commenced or you know, how you were inspired? Um, when, I, when I was a youngster, my father was always um, playing around with clocks, mainly clocks, as that was his thing. But he also had a collection of watches. Um, and what I found is on, on the shelf in, in his, um, his study, he had a series of books, but the most interesting one was, was Donald DeCarle's Practical Watch Repairing. Um, and this is a book, I've probably sold quite a number of them over the years for, for the author, although he's no longer with us. Um, because this, this book, when I read it, it was something that as a young person you could read and really understand. It's beautifully written. Um, it's illustrate, the illustrations are superb. They're, they're all hand illustrations, but they're absolutely superb. And I recommend it to anybody who's interested to know how a watch works. Um, you, it starts off with the bench, the tools, a simple movement. It's, it's actually an Amiga. They use as the base movement. Um, you recognise you recognize it when you, you, you do one of these watches in later years. Um, and I, I, I read this book and uh, it sort of it, it set a seed in me. Next thing was I, I found some old movements of my father's that, that he had in, in, in tobacco tins. I tried to repair them. I think I ruined just about every one of them because um, these, these were old English movements with fusees and things. They're way beyond my capabilities at that stage to do. But I tried. I didn't, don't think I broke anything. I just couldn't put them back together again. Couldn't get the chains back on the fusees and such like. Um, so that's what really, really, really set the scene. Um, but I was, I was lined up to go to into the electronics industry. This is the late 60s when transistors and um, electronics was what to us in those days was the latest technology as digital is nowadays for to youngsters. That was the thing you should really go into if you were a technical person. Um, so I was lined up to go to, to Philips in Holland, um, Eindhoven, um, which my father had um, arranged for me and it sounded very exciting and I was quite looking forward to it, another country and uh, another technology. Um, but at the very last minute, um, literally a few months before I really should have been going there, I just found that I was reading all these watch books and, and it, it just set a seed into my mind that, that maybe it's something I'd, I'd like to have a look at. And I, it was very difficult then to find where to go and to find out much about horology and watchmaking. Um, but with, a, with, a, with, a, with help from my mother, who was quite good, she, she did the research, we found out there was a, a thing called the British Horological Institute. Um, and one thing I noticed on the book, Donald DeCarle, the, on, on the cover of the book, had a FBHI after his name. Um, so I asked my father, I said, what, what's FBHI stand for? And he said, well, it's, it's a fellow, it's a fellow of something, a fellow of the uh, British Horological Institute. And, and as a youngster, I said, well, what is a, what's a, it's an odd sounding thing, a fellow, but you know, what's that? He said, well, it's, it's usually the, the highest sort of accolade you can get in, a, in a, a certain area of expertise. So that was my target, and I wanted to become a fellow. I wanted to have those initials after my name, um, and, um, and eventually I got them. I, you know, about five, year, about five years later, I became a fellow of the British Archaeological Institute by passing the relevant e examination. Um, and that was it. I, I, I went to Hackney Technical College in London and there were some wonderful lecturers there um, where they taught me um, really how to design things, how to draw, how to make things. It was, it was more of a, um, a making foundation than that it was a watchmaker or a watch repairer sort of foundation. It wasn't really that at all, but it was a wonderful basis. Um, and, and it also allowed me to get the right exam results to get my fellowship, which was, which was very, very nice, satisfying. Um, and after that it was, um, where do I go next? Uh, and uh, Switzerland was the obvious place to go. So I went to Switzerland and uh, went to Worcester. And, uh, I was the first um, English student to go there, um, which was quite nice. And, uh, and from there I went to Rolex. You know, I finished, I, I, I qualified at uh, WASTEP and then I went to uh, Rolex in Geneva and um, did the course that they, they, they run there which made me an official Rolex watchmaker and then after that and so on and so on various other companies.
I, I spent, a, be, interestingly, between my time at um, Hackney College and going to Switzerland, I had a brief, about a six month period, and I, and I, I worked at Garrard at that time. Uh, it was a, a lovely shop, 112 Regent Street in, in London, and a beautiful, there was the Crown Jewelers, um, a lovely place to work. And, and when I came back from Switzerland, I worked at Rolex for some years, and after that I decided to go back to, to Garrard's and that was the best move I ever made because that's where I met Mary Louise yeah. and uh, we, um, who, who actually worked for me in the department that, that we, there was a department called the OB department that was looked after all the, um, the watch making and clock making in the showroom and uh, Mary Louise came to work there while I was, I was the, uh, the showroom watchmaker and that's where we met, so that was my best move. And it was a lovely shop. I, I, I was very sad when I go out Regent Street now and I see 112. It was a wonderful shop, if anyone remembers it, from, the, uh, from that period, as the Crown Jewelers. Yeah. Beautiful building. And you also had some really interesting uh, clients there that used to come and see you. Oh, no, I know we, we, you've spoken about that before in the past. Yeah, no, but it was fun to be um, the watchmaker in the showroom because you used to meet all, all the, you know, yeah, there were some very high profile um, stars and um, I mean one time I remember we had um, Charlton Heston came in and this this big rangy chap came down and it, it was you know it's, it's like you say you you have a reverence when you meet certain people when you meet Charlton Heston you're meeting God or yeah. Moses you know yeah. I mean? or, or Ben Hur you know I mean this, yeah. this chap you know and he was a big, big chap very, very impressive seemed a, seemed a nice guy as well and yeah another another American um, I met there was um, James Coburn Okay. Who, uh, who, who really was a nice chap. Now he came in and uh, bought a watch and uh, he needed me to fit it onto his wrist. So it, again, big rangey, sort of six foot two, six foot three guy, but very, very thin wrists, really, really slim wrists. And he bought this big chronograph, I remember, I think it was an Orfina uh, with a, with a, on a bracelet. And it, it took me about an hour and a half to make it fit his wrist, taking links one side, then the other side. And he was such a nice chap, it really was a pleasure to to, to, to the, um, when I was at WASTEP. Um, WASTEP have always had a, a policy that um, throughout the course the, the, uh, the students work on a project um, from one end to the other of the course and, and, and the project the year we were there, I was very lucky, was it, it only ran for I think two or three years was to use a Valjoux Calibre 72 um, movement which, which the school brought in in its absolute base form so it was just the plates not the brass parts are not plated or anything they're just they're just off the machine as they spat out of the, of the of the machines that make the parts the steel parts are the same uh, there's no jewels fitted into it this is the really basic movement so we were given one of these and, and over the period of the course as we did as we learned and were taught um, certain areas of expertise we apply that to our project piece so you slowly built the watch up um, over the whole period uh, the, the last part was obviously the spring in and the, the, the making of the, you know, the, the making of the balance spring because you did everything. I mean, the balance springs were were um, Niverox one balance uh -huh. springs from the Niverox fashion, but they're just a, a spiral with, with nothing egg, which is full of balance springs, all tangled up together. Because the, the the professor, one of the things he did once you built a spring, which meant you you selected it, calculated the what they call the CGS number, which is centimeter gram seconds, which is the the strength of the spring if you like and um, you had to calculate that for the particular balance of the watch and then make the spring which is to to collet it cut the center out pin it into the collet pin it to the stud and then form the overcoil once all that was done and he was happy with it it was it was running flat concentric round um, then he would destroy it he would just pull it out and say go and do it again and you make another one and another one and another one and this went on for months and after some months you were very good at balance springs. It's it's the only way to do it. It's time. It takes. It's it's great practice. For in recent years, a lot of people have asked me, why don't you try and make a, a version of your your original school watch, the the, the Wastep watch? And uh, it's something that um, it sort of came into my mind, and I spoke to Mary Louise about it um, probably four or five years ago. Um, then I did have a bit of a health scare. I had had some some heart problems. I had to have a new heart valve. So Mary Louise always says it's me. You know, I've got a new mainspring fitted. It seems to be working well. It's uh, it's it's okay. So that was about four or five years ago. And after that, it did it did spur me 
to think, yeah, I should really perhaps do this. It was the thing I think that pushed me over the edge of being a bit lazy and uh, you know talking about it but not doing anything. So um, so we we got on with it and, and the idea was to, to to find a movement that would that would work nicely with the five hands at the centre, like my original watch, um, because the original Valjou movements have not been made since the early 1970s. Um, and, and my favourite chronograph movement, really, uh, uh, of, of the modern ones, is the Alpramero. It's a beautiful movement. There are some other lovely self-winding movements that have come out since, but no one's really better than the Alpramero for, for aesthetics. Yeah. Um, I just love the layout. It's got a layout which is a little bit like the, 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 the original Valjou, where the, the components are all visible on what you were saying earlier. How you like watches where you can see all the parts. I do. Yeah, uh, rather than hidden under bridges. Yeah. I, I do. I mean, the yeah. Alpamero is rather like that. Yeah. I mean, you're, you're more of a purist than me, I think, in terms of on divers' watches, you would expect to see a solid case back, for, for example. Yeah, if it's a divers' watch, it's got, it doesn't have a glass back. Yeah. So, you know, this and is I, simple, it's professionalism. It's. Uh, I, I, so you, whereas for me, I, I must say that I'm perhaps a Philistine, but I, I still want my sapphire case back to some degree. And I think part of it, I liken it to. Uh, Go into a restaurant, I'm in a fine meal, and it's been prepared by a Michelin star chef, and somebody says, But hold your nose, you can't smell. Yeah. And I know there's all that beauty of craftsmanship yeah. in the case. Yeah. And perhaps as a watchmaker, you get to see that beauty more often than, the, than I watch. Watchmakers, watch uh, yeah, we're privileged. Yeah, very privileged. Yeah. You get to see some beautiful craftsmanship, yeah. and I just want to share some of that story, and that's yeah. why I like the sapphire back. But, in terms of the, the constant treat, I want this uh, exhibition, exhibition case back, it lends itself to that. Well, I. Yeah, I fitted a, I did fit a, a, a sapphire back, you know, back in the, the early seventies into my watch. So I, I can't yeah. really complain about that. Yeah. And it is still waterproof. I mean, yeah, there's not a real problem. But it's just that the purest of me says, if it's a diver's watch, it shouldn't have a glass back. But I, I was having a situation where people wanted to see the movement, and I'd take the back off, and it's not very good to do that. So yeah. glass back works. So again, when I put the glass back in my watch. Um, it was pretty well not a done thing. There, there were very few watches with glass backs, so, so I had a problem. I wanted a, I wanted a sapphire glass. I was with Rolex then, and Rolex fortunately used sapphire glasses in the Cellini range. Okay. So, so the glass in the back of my watch, in my original watch, is a Cellini, very thin you know, sapphire glass from one of their dress watches. So it was, um, it ended up in the Rolex in the in the, the, the my watch. With rather, with rather a few other Rolex parts. Uh, <laughs> I also bet you mentioned Chile that their, their collection this year at, at SIH, oh, yeah. that's right, Basel World 2014. For me, the Cellini product actually is the best it's ever been for a long time. Yeah, it, yeah. Very, very attractive. Yeah. Like, you know, the, yeah. The dance no, there's cool. been a big change with Rolex, with um, Cellini's, with the Tudor range. Yeah. The whole range has been revamped. Yeah. Um, uh, very effectively. I mean, you, you, you mentioned Tudor there. I mean, I'm slightly digressing here, mm. but I mean, in terms of respecting other brands, I mean, I personally have a soft spot for Tudor. I know you, we've, we've talked about yeah. this. I mean, great designs, great value for money. Uh, superb value for money. Yeah, fantastic you, you get price. the Rolex quality, but a, a super price. Yeah. And now with the, the, the new designs, you get a lovely product. It's, it's, the designs are so beautiful. I mean, yeah. and I like the, it's got a nostalgia quotient, but it's not yeah. a, it's been evolved for a modern audience. So yeah. Whereas we have, you know, we might reference a model from the 1950s or 60s. But mm. It's not an absolute replica. What they've done is they've oh, no, no, like distilled it for a yeah. new audience. Yeah. And I, I just think that's a, it's a, 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 it's a, a great design thing. period. It's, uh, and with my, my new concentric, I've tried to get that same feeling because the original watch was, was a watch from the sort of 60s, early 70s and I've tried to make the modern watch have that same feel. Yeah. It's deliberately a bit of nostalgia there, but at the same time it's bang up to date technologically. Yeah. And the case now must be to what size is that? 42. See that's a very wearable size isn't it? I it's mean, as that... big as I would, I, I, I was almost forced by what people want, you yeah. know, this is a market thing. I know you, 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 you said well, I'm not really into the market too much, <laughs> but I, I, I appreciated that if I, the original watch was 40, yeah, and then the new one's 42, so a little increase. Although the new one does look a lot bigger, yeah, because the the bezel is a much smaller proportion to the size of the dial compared yeah. to the original. So there's some quite subtle changes in the design of the watch, um, which which gives a much bigger look to it. 
Yeah. Um, but at the same time, to me, 42 is as big as you can reasonably wear. I think anything bigger than 42 is just, it's, it's, it's a bit pointless to go much bigger. It's when you make watches in such small numbers, I mean, the, there is no economy of scale at all. So, yeah. to, so to have to, and everything in, in, in my watch is, is, is made in Switzerland. Yeah. Um, all the design and, and, the, and the prototype work I, d I do in the UK, yeah. but the watch is all made in Switzerland and made with Swiss parts and nothing comes from anywhere else. So there's no saving there. Yeah. Um, and, and, and it is the very best. I mean, the case is made by one of the best case makers in the world and certainly one of Switzerland's top case maker. I'm very lucky there with, with having a friendship with, with the owner that, that allows this to happen because, to be honest, if you go to a, a top Swiss case manufacturer and say, look, I want to make some cases, yeah, okay, um, what's your proposal will be the next thing, and they'll say, well, I want 40, um, then they just show you the door. Yeah. Or, or, they, or they'll come up with a, a figure that's just such a huge figure that it's impossible to, 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 to commercially make the watch. Because looking at it from their perspective, I mean, it, just the tooling up costs, the setup costs it are, is. are very, yeah. very high. They're extreme, yeah, you have to do, they're just, just the drawings and setting up of the machines, yeah. CNC machines now. In my case, is a very difficult case to make. I, yeah. I'm, I'm, unfortunately, I'm quite renowned for coming up with case designs that are very, very expensive and hard to make. Um, yeah. My time with Bremont, with the MB case, it's, again, it's, it's a beautiful design, beautiful case, but very, very hard to make, very complicated. Yeah. Um, there are easier ways of making cases, and the, and the concentrique, again, the angles, although it, it just looks like a, you know, a, a nice proportion case, the angles and, and the, 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 the finish on it is very hard, hard to do. So after the CNC machine um, work, there's, there's about 11 hours of hand work on that case to get the, to get the finish on there. Because certainly for me, when I'm, you, you can discern the quality though. If you run your fingers, my, my eyes are not the best because I'm getting older now, but hmm. you run your hand on the case band, the, the tactility is fantastic. It, it feels yeah, beautiful I hope so. to the touch. Yeah, I hope so. Yes, when designing the case, um, you can just make it as beautiful as, as possible and not worry about the consequences for the for the, maybe the watchmaker and the case manufacturer. There are things to take into account. There's the manufacturing, how difficult and how expensive it is to make those particular shapes and angles that, that you've chosen. There's then the, the final assembly and the watchmaker in the future. Um, people will have to take these watches apart and put them back together again and how difficult that will be. Um, and then there's also um, how durable your case will be in wear um, and this is something you can address maybe with hardening techniques and, and such like um, but I, I my again being a bit of a purist my my feeling with watch cases is nothing beats the lovely stainless steel it's, it's the best material for a watch case there are other variations there's titanium there's there's, there's, there's coatings and such like but why bother I mean, I just love stainless steel. This is 316L, you are? Yeah, yeah, three, good, good old 316 is, is about as good as it gets. But yeah. you, you can change the alloy, you can make it a little bit harder. There's always a trade-off though. If you make it harder, it tends to be a little bit less corrosion resistant. Yeah. If you go for, if you go for a super diver's watch, then you, you probably want a softer version. It usually has to be quite soft stainless steel so yeah. that you get the anti-corrosion effect. So 316 is like a, a good average, a good, a good middle ground to use. It polishes beautifully. It's yeah. got a lovely cut and, and finish to it. Um, so you've got to think to say yes, but it, it, it can scratch. So what you do then is you try and design it in such a way that the, it won't scratch very easy. It won't, the parts that would scratch are protected by other parts. So on the concentrique case, I have a bezel which uses a very hard beryllium bronze in, on the bezel insert. And the way the bezel is designed, it pretty much protects most of the case. Yeah. Um, the, the glass, the sapphire glass, again, is very protective of the case. There's a lot of glass, not too much flat surface at the top exposed. Um, and again, it has a hardening treatment on there, an anti-reflection, which is the best the Swiss watch industry can do. Well, so now, well, if we start with the dial, I mean, the dial is very, very complicated. It's um, and I think probably uh, the year we made it, which was last year, it's probably the most expensive dial made in Switzerland. Um, unless you're talking about dials covered in diamonds and, and such like. But taking those out of the equation, conventional type dials, it, we, I, I'm pretty sure that's the most expensive dial the Swiss made last year. Because 
it, uh, it, it was so hard to develop, it was so hard to get it right and to print the, it's a three dimensional dial, it's not just done on one level, yeah. the, the actual base plate of the dial, we make that ourselves yeah. and then we supply that to the, the dial manufacturer we found it was better to do it that way to actually make the, the, the actual dial plate to get the precision, then supply it to the dial manufacturer and for them to print it. Yeah. We did try it the other way around first for them to supply the base uh, plate as well, but it just wasn't precise enough for what we required. The date track on, 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 on our dial uh, sits on, on a, a raised plinth on the dial and to print onto that, it's, it's so precise to get it absolutely in the centre very very difficult to do yeah so it was something we had to develop with the dial manufacturer in, in and that's done in a, a lovely company in Le Chaux de Fault um, and, and they, they got there with it so the game we're only doing 40 dials so you know, there's no cost gain there so each dial is a very expensive um, piece and they're, they're also very very delicate so we lose a few in assembly yeah um, it's just the way it is yeah. so, so, so that's an area that um, I was very pleased with the results on that. I, mean, I would like the dial to be a little bit um, tougher, but it just can't be. It's just the way it is. So, so occasionally on assembly, you, you, know, you, you can you can damage a dial. So we lose a number of dials on, on assembly. That's me. I'm blaming myself when I say on assembly. I assemble the watches, so it's uh, the the odd dial it gets messed up. Um, but it, it happens. Now the hands are the same. The hands are all individually made for the watch. They're some of the longest hands you'll see on a, on a 42mm watch. Uh, that surprised me when, I, when I, I designed them. Because the bezel is very slim, the dial is very large, it's yeah. larger than it seems. And I was absolutely surprised how long the hands are. The centre seconds hands are very special, and the minute hand. Um, so again, and then the centre, where all five hands, what, what I call the stack, which is the centre part, where it's all about the concentric mechanism. You have five hands all coming out of the same hole in the dial. The so it's, be very... it's very tight. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and it's it's a lot of hand sort of fettling, if you like, to yeah. make to make it all work. And you I mean, going back to Concentric Five, which I think we can safely say now it's virtually all sold out. You know, what yeah. I, mean? I mean that's been uh, very very popular for you. Um, in terms of. Uh, the legacy, if you will. Mm -hmm. uh, we've got James, uh, your son, who's a, a very accomplished watchmaker in his own right. Um, can we expect to see the Roberts uh, continu continuity with the Roberts family and hopefully future models uh, to, uh, it, yeah. to, to carry the Roberts name? I hope so. I mean, I, I, we just have, it, it, it's, it's a cliche, but we have to watch this space. Um, yeah, I mean, J James is in his early days. And he, he's he's got some some good ideas. Yeah. So so yes. So I think that'll be. Well, I hope Peter, be, you'll invite me to join you on that journey and see some of these mm. watches come to realisation. Oh, certainly. Because because I I, uh, I have to say I think that the Constitute was a fantastic watch, and I think the, the watch industry is far richer for having people like you in it. Thank, Thank you. you very much for your time. Thank you.